Hello, I'm Scott Witzo, the owner, brewer, and dreamer here at Wits End Brewing Company in Denver, Colorado, and you're watching The Beer Diaries. Cheers. How's it going? Good, man. How are you? Good. I'm Greg from The Beer Diaries. Hey, Greg Scott from Wits End Brewing Company. How are you? I am really good. It's a really nice day here in Denver, and I am ready to try some beers. Any chance there's some in there? I think I might be able to help you out in here. Let's go and check it awesome. out. Awesome. Let's go. All right. Any good tour should probably start with a beer. Absolutely. So what would be a kind of a good introductory starting beer? You got about seven on, I think, right now. Well, I think I do. I've got seven on right now, and I think we just go to the top of the list with uh, Jean-Claude Van Blonde. It's a <laughs> Belgian-style blonde ale. Ah. Uh, I think that's the, the best way for us to start out. So let me get a couple beers poured and I'll that, show you around. That would be sweet. What's the most you ever have on? On average, I usually have about seven beers on. Okay. Um, I have had as many as eight beers on before. Um, that's the reason for my homebrew keg grater and my jockey box that right, you normally right. see at festivals. But around here, uh, any way I can get some beer poured, I'll, uh, I'll utilize whatever equipment I can. So I'm guessing uh, Jean-Claude is a blonde, Belgian blonde, you said? Like it Belgian is a pale? Belgian blonde ale. It's based on that style. Um, it is a, definitely a, a nice, light, approachable beer. Cool. Uh, it's got a little bit of oats in there, which kind of help give it a little bit of body. Nice. Um, and the yeast that I use helps give it some of these clovey and pineapple kind of flavors cool. you're getting in there. So. Very nice. Very good. Cheers. Cheers. Welcome. This will keep us going for the whole tour, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so always this is the tap room. You open four or five days a week? I'm open four days a week right now. So yeah, we'll have, uh, we'll have guests come in here and hang out and have a few pints, um, try some samples, have a tour. That kind of thing. And so we, where would you go from here? We should so continue. Me, yeah, let me, let me show you. So we got obviously the, the tap room up here. Yeah. The, that's, that's where all the action is. So head towards the brew house. Absolutely. That's where all the magic happens. Nice. Happy to show you how I create all these beers here. Just back through the employees only door. Right through the, it used to be employee only. Yeah, I was going to say, like, it looks like the Hess is extra since it's, you have just an employee. added recently. Yeah. So. so to the brew house. To the brew house. Everything in here is, is made on this system here. Uh, this is what you would call a one barrel system. Yeah. Uh, 31 gallons of beer at a time. Uh, everything is very, very manual as you can see. There's no controls. Is it, did you buy this all as one unit or you kind of like bought pieces or how did you put it all together? I kind of pieced it together. Um, some of the components I had uh, made in town here, the frame, okay. um, but otherwise just kind of pieced the components together to, uh, to create a, a one barrel system. Uh, most one barrel systems out there are like that. They typically don't sell a lot of uh, turnkey one barrel systems. Not everybody is crazy enough to do a one barrel brewery, so is, yeah, there's not is, a big market is, for Is that it. something that like a brew, brew pub may even do? Or they a brew pub might. That might. would probably be a little bit of a, a better candidate for that, just simply because they have the food side uh, as well. But, right, right. Uh, so what are the different vessels? What are the, what are the three vessels? So what we've here? got here, the center one is what's called the mash tun. Uh, that's where the grains are mixing with the hot water at a specific temperature for a specific period of time. That's how you sort of extract all the sugars that will later be fermented. Yep. Um, the one to the right there is called a hot liquor tank, and it's where I'll store the hot water uh, when I'm about to sparge and rinse those grains again to fill up the boil kettle here, which is on the left. And that is a, this is a 55 gallon kettle. These two are 30. Uh, but when all is said and done, after brewing the beer and fermentation, uh, ends up being about 31 finished gallons of beer, one barrel. So. Right. And so it boils in there for a while, and then you go through the heat exchanger? Like a yeah, we've got a heat exchanger mounted kind of on the end of the frame there. And you got to so, go through as fast as possible. You want to get down to like sub-roomish temperature in that zone? Absolutely. Like you want to get it down to about 68 degrees, ideally, uh, depending on the beer. Uh, but it's very important to get that cooled right away. You don't want to risk the chance of uh, bacteria or something getting in there that shouldn't be eating those sugars. Um, once that's cooled down, or as that's cooling down, I'll fill it into one of the fermenters. These two we have here are uh, three barrel fermenters. Okay. Uh, the most sophisticated equipment I have here, they're jacketed. Uh, glycol circulates through here. I've got a glycol control over there that controls the temperature very specifically as it's fermented. It's called thing two. And thing two. That's thing one. And we got thing one over there. All exactly. right, all right. <laughs> 
And you have other, you know, I saw some other smaller ones we too. We do, right? yeah, and I can show you those. We have uh, one barrel uh, fermenters as well. Those are not jacketed. I've got eight of those and these two guys here. So I have a total fermentation capacity of 14 barrels, but again, okay. it's all being done on a one barrel system. And so you got to do like brew three times. So three. Three times in one of these. That's a that's long a, day. Yeah, that's a long, <laughs> long day, isn't it? Because I mean, brew cycles four to six hours, maybe eight hours maybe? It's about that, yeah. It's what about a 15 hour day to fill yeah. up one of these guys. So we've, we've gotten it down to that. It used to take me about 20 hours to do oh. it, and that was uh, tough. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So why don't we take a little look at the other Yeah, let me show you the other room here. here. So in this room here, we've got the uh, some of the one barrel fermenters. As cool. I said, I have eight. Just got three of them in here right now. Um, a little bit different than what we've got in there with the three barrel fermenters. I have, uh, these are single walled, so I have to run either a room air conditioner or a space heater to control the ambient temperature. Yeah, so, in the, here. so yeah, so temperature is a little bit it's more. Not, it's not inherently in, he, in this unit. You have to run the room. I got, I got to run the room. So it's a little bit more complicated, but again, the, you know, the manual process is, is throughout uh, the place. Here, you do so. right on them. You have this high tech digital. Got the high tech Sharpies on Sharpie there. Yep, absolutely. Keeping track of that. Uh, most of these are actively fermenting right now. We just brewed this a couple days ago. Um, these guys here are going to be ready to wheel into the cooler and we'll crash the yeast down, um, pull that out and use that again. Um, and then these will actually be dry hops. So in about a week and a half or so, we're going to be able to pour these from the tap room. They'll be ready to keg. Cool. And you also have the barrels out front there. That's yeah, we've got a couple uh, uh, whiskey barrels from a local distillery here, just right down the street, as a matter of fact. Um, nothing in there yet, just lots of ideas and plans. Um, unfortunately, with a one barrel system, committing 55 gallons to a wood barrel is a little bit difficult to do right now. So. It's got to stay there for a while, right? Like, like months, months to a year kind of Absolutely, thing? Absolutely, yeah. Months to, to, even, yeah, to even a year, depending on the beer. So well, someday. Cool. Well, that about does it. Let's. Um, I'm almost done here, so Likewise. we should probably uh, get up front. Try some more beers. Yeah, let's, let's do go. It. All right. <laughs> hey, folks. I'm Greg from the Beer Diaries. I am here at Wits End Brewing with Scott Witzo. He is the owner, head brewer, and dreamer at the brewery, and uh, we're going to talk about what, how things have been from the last year and a half they've been operating, and learn a bit about the beers we'll be tasting a little bit later. Absolutely. So thanks for uh, having us. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Great having you out here, Greg. So does this happen very often? I mean, you guys are one of the larger breweries on the Denver scene. Or? <laughs> I would say we're, we're actually probably the smallest brewery in Denver. We have that distinction. So it's, it's pretty <laughs> awesome. I mean, I think that was one of the things we want to do is showcase some of the folks. I mean, not just the big guys, but other people that are, you know, just making great beer here in town. Like, and so, so how big are you guys? How would you, how would you describe your scale? Sure. Most breweries, uh, you kind of, um, refer to yourselves in terms of the size of your brew house and mine is a one barrel system so I call myself a one barrel brewery wow um, I think much of the uh, brewing community agrees that three barrels or less would be what you'd call a nano brewery yeah, yeah, so yeah. Um, that's uh, definitely what so I you're technically it. nano I'm technically nano but you got I mean it's interesting because we're sitting in your tap room here we got actually a pretty good pretty good space um, you have a quite a range of beer so in spite of the nano production um, size you're punching way over your weight i think is that pretty fair you think? i think so uh, you know we we have um, 14 barrels of fermentation capacity which relative to the size of the system i think is a pretty good amount to, to be able to produce here um, one of the fun things about having uh, a nano brewery and doing one barrel at a time is it does allow for a little bit more experimentation um, and in some ways actually a little bit more control over the beer because there's not a lot of automated processes to it yeah, so we yeah. know our system we know how to brew the beer um, and it gets to uh, turn out the way we expect, and then having um, one barrel to play around a little bit and experiment with recipes. Do you find you get a lot of great feedback from the folks that come in here? I get great feedback. I've, I've got some of the best customers coming in, bringing in new friends, and really being able to sit and hear what they have to say about each of the beers, whether it's positive or even if there's some uh, critical feedback I might yeah, get yeah. sometimes. Um, I like having kind of that honesty over the bar with folks so they feel they can talk to the brewer and they can actually have maybe some kind of input. Do, do they all know you're the brewer too? Like, they all know, yeah. I think the beard's a dead giveaway, <laughs> but I, yeah. They, we'll they get to know. that later. There's, there'll be some beard conversations a little later. Yeah, I, I feel, this is one of those rare interviews I feel terribly inadequate, but I'll, we'll get to that. And so, so obviously in Denver, there's a lot of breweries. We've sort of dubbed the area the Beer Muta Triangle. Um, we've got... Uh, <laughs> you got to pat, pat that. <laughs> I know get, we should get, pat get, that, Get right? a website going. Um, we find folks will come in on the weekend either on, on bike tours and trying to hit a few of the places or um, tour groups will come in. It just provides kind of the opportunity for folks to have a really good sampling of a lot of different breweries doing very different things from each other, uh, all within a pretty close proximity. So it's a great place to be. So. How do you imagine it's going to unfold? I mean, it's interesting. The Colorado and Denver scene, I mean, also the other cities, like, again, like Boulder and, and, and Fort Collins, Longmont. There's, there's a, just a lot of beer here. Like, do you think there's a, a finite limit? I mean, it seems as though there's new stuff opening continually. 
Todd Tebow, one of the, the marketing director oh, yeah, yeah, over yeah. at Breckenridge, yeah. if you've met him. I think he said once uh, that, you know, how, how many how many rock bands can there be? You know, like, <laughs> how, how, what's the limit on that? Yeah, that's kind of yeah, what yeah, brewing yeah. is right now. Um, well, yeah, it's a really, really interesting fact on that. Like, I, I think this is accurate. I read on, um, I read on a website. It's totally oh, accurate. <laughs> the amount of beer bought in the U.S. in a year is $96 billion. Oh, my God. So <laughs> the pie is pretty damn big. It is. Like, it, so, so that's actually one of the interesting things, obviously, is, is that, you know, crap crap beer is still a sub 10 percent i mean yeah absolutely six, six and a half six maybe nine, yeah. you know across across the whole u.s there's a lot of room so wits and and wit is, is there ever been any issues around the naming and sort of the collisions with any other breweries or anything like that you know i had uh, there was a, a instance uh, it seems it was six months ago six to eight months ago um there's a uh, brewery that opened up in california and they had a wits and wit speaking of wits um got an email from the from the owner and just kind of explaining that they didn't know that I had existed and um, they've sort of already gotten into the process of opening with this new beer and they were opening in a couple weeks. And I got that and you sort of hear in the craft brew industry, unfortunately there's been um, a little bit more uh, legal issues happening. There's been time, there's, there's starting to be some actually sort of corporate collisions. There's occurring, starting to be, yeah. Unfortunately, which is sad. It some, is pretty sad. Because some of the guys, like, you know, call it to Avery and Russian River. I mean, they had collaboration, not litigation, when they both did Salvation, which is, you know, pretty damn cool. Yeah. Like that, I, that's actually one of the coolest things. That's kind of the model, I think, for most yeah. of us. We sort of see that and try to aspire to that. That's not yeah. to say that there aren't situations in which you might have to protect your name, but yeah, yeah. this was one where I, I kind of thought about it a little bit and, and, and chatted with some friends and. Um, decided that, you know, as long as we're not occupying the same market and we're not, yeah. I'm not sending to California, he's not sending up here. Um, I told him to, to go ahead and move forward with it. I, I don't have an issue. And if we were to be in the same market, that might be a little bit of a different conversation. But um, having uh, opened this place, I know what it takes to kind of go through everything to open up your brewery and all the details. And when a curveball gets thrown your yeah, way, yeah, it's the last yeah. thing you want to deal with. Oh, so, the, especially at the very end. Especially right? at the very yeah. end. So I, I uh, was sensitive to that, and in the spirit of that collaboration, that awesome. litigation, yeah. I, I said move forward. And I hope he sends you a whole bunch of beer. Like, <laughs> I know, I mean, right? Said, I'm yeah, going to be looking for him at GABF this yeah, year. Yeah, be like, all right, well, what's, what's going to have to happen <laughs> yeah, is every exactly. month? Exactly. <laughs> Speaking of GABF, yes. um, your first one was last year. First was last year. So yeah. what was that like? As a, as you know, you've been. I think you have you been before. You've been a number of times, perhaps as a fan. Like yeah. how, how many times have you been there? Um, I would say I've probably been to it about ten times. Ten I've gone times. just about every year since I've lived wow. here. It was. Uh, that was one of my most amazing Colorado beer experiences going into the GABF for the first time. It was just unbelievable. But really, just to be there um, with all these other amazing breweries that have been around for years and people I admire very much and some of the beers they're making and to kind of sit there and, and, and be on that side of the table was just quite an experience for me. So it was great. It was wonderful. So one of the other things about GABF is, I mean, leading up to it, the Craft Brewers Association had a contest, didn't they? They did, yeah. What, yeah. Was, the, what was the contest? <laughs> it was for the uh, best beard of craft beer. I seem to have noticed there's some beards involved in craft brewing. Is that something you've noticed as well? They, you know, I, I tend to see a few beards every now and again. How'd you do in the contest? <laughs> uh, I'm happy to say I finished second uh, in the competition. So. Probably out of, out of 10,000 people, <laughs> arguably. Like, I, don't, I don't know if it was quite that many, but... Like, uh, probably in that zone, right? <laughs> pro um, so, so it's going to be this next GABF. Like, hey, you're the guy exactly, with the beard. Exactly. I mean, maybe. Well, you know, i got to say, though, the guy that won was from Stone Brewing, and they make some pretty awesome yeah, beers, too. So. <laughs> hard, it's hard to, hard to beat those dudes. So uh, what's your philosophy of... Um, food and beer pairings. I mean, beer, people don't realize, pairs, frankly, better than wine, um, than with foods. I mean, try asparagus and wine, just try it. Um, <laughs> Great point. <laughs> other, so, so, but, but, so beer and food, what, what's your philosophy? I believe it, sh it should create something new. It shouldn't just be complementary. Together, it should create kind of a new flavor. That's sort of what I try to accomplish whenever I um, have the opportunity to do food and beer pairings. Um, sort of surprise the person. I mean, sort of surprise the person. Like I, think, yeah. I think that's actually one of the interesting things about craft beer too right now is that people like when they when a person tries this setup of beers, their mind will be blown because like none of them, not not a single one of these is the beers they've grown up with or are familiar with. Like if you haven't had craft beer before, like these are all completely different, foreign, completely a little foreign. over the place. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, 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 in a positive way because they'll go like they'll find fruit, they'll find sure. like like roasted roasted elements, they'll find. You know, herbal elements. It's it's gonna they're gonna find stuff in here that they never had before. And so with food. Oh like yeah, that's... there was a lady that's writing a book on Denver restaurants and breweries, and I was lucky enough to be paired up with Euclid Hall downtown, great place down there. Um, and the chef came in here, and we sort of tried the beers. We kind of talked through it oh, a little cool. bit, and we ended up pairing the uh, porter I have here, the rye porter, 
uh, with an oyster in, in the half shell. Yeah. And we went through the aromatics and all the things. I got to visit him at the restaurant. We tried, I don't know, like two dozen oysters. It was a wonderful afternoon. So but different different types just of oysters? Different, different types of oysters and uh, different types of um, uh, aromatics and flavors and different things we would put in there to find that combination. And it was one of those things where the final uh, combination that we had, it was absolutely a, something completely unique and new together when you drank the two together, right, right, or you right. drank and ate the food at the same time. So. Awesome. And you have some formal training in this, I'll say. It's, um, it's on the BJCP kind of. <laughs> you, you, you have the, the, the wreath and the, the, they give you some sort of like like lapel sort of that you can wear. Something that like that, goes? yeah. Like, so what's, what's your BJCP experience? Um, in uh, doing the, the formal BJCP training, it allowed me to kind of explore um, specific style guidelines and what it takes to create a very specific style. Um, whereas home brewing, I would kind of tweak things and, and, and kind of not follow a specific style, just kind of make what I wanted to. And by learning how to make the style accurately, that sort of gave me the tools to tweak those variables that I wanted. If I wanted uh, an IPA that had a little bit more of a fruity quality to it, then I would kind of tweak the yeast and that sort of thing. And that okay. really helped me a lot as a brewer um, to think more critically about uh, taste uh, as well as uh, the construction uh, of beers. And I think that definitely feeds into the kind of the pairing thing as well. Yeah, if you yeah, notice yeah, the sure. different flavors and components and, and compare yeah. that with food. I like cooking too, so. Oh, so it all kind of fits it together. It all kind of comes together. So are you the company sensory panel then? Is that fair? <laughs> you, you and Pat are the sensory <laughs> Pat panel? Pat and I are, yeah, that's exactly right. Actually, exactly I imagine, right. you know, the, again, the customers probably have some perspectives to they share do too. they do I mean it's um, it's great hearing their feedback particularly if they're picking up on things that I wanted to be in the beer is but, it really rewarding when someone goes oh yeah I, I get a bit of spice and a bit of herbal <laughs> like is, is, that, is that kind of like it is like you're like yes it's amazing I mean it's I didn't come or approach brewing from an extremely technical background I would say kind of more artistic and maybe even more like uh, cooking like not that yeah, I'm a okay. chef but sort of more that perspective yeah, kind yeah. Of feeling your way through stuff um, so for me to kind of, in a lot of ways, I feel like pour my heart and soul in these beers and recipes and to have um, someone come in here and enjoy that and have that feedback or noticing these little differences in there uh, really is one of the most gratifying things in the world. I mean, that's, that's what makes it worth doing this all the time other than the fact that it's the most wonderful industry to be in in the world but <laughs> well it's um, full it's full of awesome people it's full like, of awesome people like, like, i think i think i think one of the, one of the things that like again on this show like you'll see over and over and over again that there are just fabulous people that we get to talk to it's like the most rewarding thing imaginable you, you people that are like sort of entrepreneurs that are passionate about what they do that give a shit about what they make, like really care. And not only that, really get off on the fact that their sort of direct consumer who comes in here, tries it, the, the feedback loop is tiny, right? Oh, yeah. And so it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And I think, you know, craft beer, um, just like any other sort of consumable product, I think people care more now about being connected with the producers of the yeah, things yeah, they're yeah. eating, and whether it's this, kind of the slow food movement and that Very sort of local, thing. Very like local. Getting hyper local and, yeah. and wanting to know the producers, wanting to know what you're consuming, getting away from some of that mass production stuff, and you know, it's kind of follow that same trend in food as um, with beer now. And people want to know, they want to meet the brewer, they want yeah, to yeah, yeah. Um, know how these beers were thought about and made, and what's in them, and that kind of thing. And um, that gets back to that whole fact that the average customer, I think, coming in now is very savvy about craft beer yeah. and makes for a great conversation for sure. So my beer is almost gone, and, and the, <laughs> I've been staring at this amazing lineup. So where should we start? Uh, so I recommend starting kind of in the bottom row there. Those are my rotating beers. Um, first one there is Bitter Late Than Never. Okay. Um, that's a English style uh, premium bitter, it's called. Which um, is just under an ESB. It's just under an ESB. Um, in general, stylistically, um, it's going to be just not quite as high of alcohol or uh, that hop characteristic. Um, and the maltiness will be down a little bit more too. It's a little, just a nice, easy drinking session beer. Um, one of those ones you can ha have a couple pints of and you yeah. know, still feel pretty nice good. Nice and dry. Um, nice and dry. A little, little bit of fruit, a little fruit in the middle. A little like, bit of fruit like, in the yeah. middle there, yeah. And I think unfortunately with some of these names, um, you hear bitter and one thinks, oh gosh, that's gonna be a... Well it's, actually, <laughs> you know? it's, well, it's actually kind of a misnomer, isn't it? Because yeah. like, as you said, like, and then you know, after you pass the fruit, there's a nice malt finish mm -hmm. that kind of like, kind of takes you to the end. And this was actually um, a charitable beer, like a, a beer that you made uh, to sort of help support a local charity, I think. For my, my daughter's um, elementary school, they do a fundraiser auction every year, and last year's winner, um, I donated a brewer for a day. Which, um, which is pretty damn cool. <laughs> like, let me tell you, like, I mean, most guys would be like, holy crap, I can make beer? The gentleman that won was uh, a home brewer in the 90s, and. Um, he had a batch of beer that he was never able to finish. His uh, first kid came a little bit early and 
uh, kind of changed his life a bit and was never able to get back into it again. So we sort of used that as the inspiration um, for both the name, of course, and uh, taking that uh, and kind of reformulating a new recipe yeah. kind of based on an English premium bitter is sort of what his recipe, his notes looked like to me. Um, so we got together, we brewed the beer and had a great time and launched it just last week. And 20% uh, of the sales of, of the beer uh, is going back to my, my daughter's school. That's awesome. School, so. That's really, really, really nice to do. Yeah, that was a fun beer to make. So so after the bitter, we go to Mick Jaggery. So Mick Jaggery. Uh, I based that beer sort of on an English style ESB. Um, a little bit of a twist to that is um, part of the namesake is Jaggery Sugar. And Jaggery Sugar is an Indian cooking sugar. It's used in sweet and savory dishes. It's, it's really nice kind of raw, earthy, minerally kind of sugar. Um, it's got and, a different nose on it too. Like it's got like a little bit, a little bit of fruit in the nose, mm -hmm, I think that mm -hmm. wasn't there before. This, and again, you compare these two, like the Mick Jaggery, darker. A little bit darker. A little, not, bit darker. not a lot. Not, not a lot, a little bit darker. It's got a little, little bit more of that malt characteristic to it. Yeah. A little bit more on the IBUs. Um, the Jaggery uh, pairs really nicely. The sweetness of that pairs really nicely with the malts. Um, and kind of that minerally sort of note pairs nice with the uh, East Kent Goldings hops that I use in that. Yeah, no, I mean the malt and the, the fruit kind of like a bit of raisin and bounce around the back, mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, that was one where um, I had a gentleman in here of Indian descent and uh, we were talking about sugars and so forth and he mentioned Jaggery. As soon as he said Jaggery, I just told him, I'm gonna make a beer called Mick Jaggery someday. I have no idea what that beer is gonna be, but that's a great here name. Here it comes. So, <laughs> a few months later, I, uh, I made that beer, so. That actually has been a very popular one too. I've made that a few times now, so that's going to be kind of one of those regular rotating beers. Yeah, that's really. I mean, so. it's got it's got like a lot, a little more like I said, fruit and tartness, but not. I mean, it's still malty finish. Like it's a nice, like it, like this one of those beers that you kind of just when you think you have it, it's kind of whoop. Like <laughs> like the the flavor it switches profile. gears a little bit. Yeah, yeah a bit. And you know, the herbal kind of earthiness on the nose, but man, it finishes. Just really nice. Thank you very much. So next, what should I go with? So I next, we'll, we'll go with the Wilford, and we're kind of getting into the hoppy world now. Uh, Wilford is what Ooh. I call a Belgian oatmeal IPA. <laughs> God, a lo lovely, pungent kind of, kind of dank. I've, heard, I've been hearing the word dank, dank a lot. Dank in Colorado. Like, I haven't heard that before, but yeah, it's got lovely <laughs> dank. So, should I be saying dank? You can say dank, sure, absolutely. Is that appropriate? That's that's appropriate. There's a few warehouses around here growing a few things that <laughs> someone might call it dank too. So. Oh, I didn't realize that. But no, it's really, really, yeah, no, like um, it's just very fragrant on this. Yeah, one. this beer, I, you know, this is this is the newest of the core beers uh, for me. I've, I've been making for almost a year now, but um, this probably embodies kind of my brewing philosophy um, in terms of just kind of drawing on different traditions and styles and kind of coming up with something unique and new and you have uh, about 10% flaked oats in the malt bill which would typically be for like an oatmeal stout. It's got some um, ni really nice, it's got some fruit and then some mm -hmm. bitterness and then a smooth finish. Like, Thank you, yeah. it's I use the um, Belgian yeast in there, that's giving it a lot of that fruitiness and spiciness. Wow. Um, I use both uh, late hop additions or Cascade and Tatnong so you okay. get into that kind of spicy citrusy interplay. I dry hop on Cascade and Tetanong as well. This is a Belgian IPA. This is what I, Belgian yeah. oatmeal IPA. Belgian, the oatmeal. Uh, I don't is, think, is, is, that, a, is that, where's that from? <laughs> that's the not an official guys. category. Not it would have category. to be like a Belgian IPA with oats added, I think would be how you'd have to communicate that. So the kitchen um, sink. So last one here, we're kind of getting out of the hoppy world, kind of playing off that roast a little bit and getting into sort of a different category. Um, Why is it called kitchen sink? Well, there's 13 different malts in the beer. Only? <laughs> Only. <laughs> I imagine when you're making the order, you're like, all right, I want 13 malts. Like, like, seriously? Like it's, it's, bags, it's a bit like... of a pain when we pull the grains for that beer. It gets a little confusing, but... Um, so, so what led you to want to do 13, 13 grains in well, this? Well, so it's, it's, I call it a rye porter. I use flaked rye, chocolate rye, and malted rye in the beer. So three different types of rye. Okay. Um, to kind of uh, compare with that, I have flaked oats in the beer as well, regular uh, barley chocolate malt, and then of course regular base malt. So you kind of have these different sort of similar flavors, but slightly a slight kind of difference between the two to create sort of this layered flavor effect of the beer. It has crazy body for a porter. Yeah. I mean, like this thing has like just, it kind of like fills your mouth with this gentle, delicious foaminess. <laughs> no, I mean, no, I'm not joking. Like this thing has, like, I don't think I've ever had a porter like this. Like, yeah, this. it's it's definitely, I mean, I think porters oftentimes can be a little bit underserved as a style. I think they're like, wow. they can be maybe slightly lighter versions of a stout. And I think for me, I wanted a porter that was a really good session beer, easy drinking, not, um, overwhelmingly chewy, but having a lot of complex flavor to the beer. And when I came up with that, that was actually my very last homebrew recipe. 
second batch of that was brewed you, in you here. Brewed, you home brewed 13 I, grains? I, I home brewed with 13 <laughs> grains. And, and kind of the reason for that was... And, uh, and your wife said, get out of the house. <laughs> exactly. Done. It's what over. What are you doing here? Having so many <laughs> barrels around and buckets. <laughs> get and rid of this stuff. That, that's, that's, I always joke that's half the reason my wife was so supportive in starting the brewery. I'd move all my, my crap out of the house. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's fabulous. But that was, uh, I had, you know, as I was going through some of my um, grains and so forth, and I had just like a lot, a little bit of this left over, a little bit of that. And then I was thinking about a porter just kind of philosophically, and you, you probably know a little bit of the history of it, but having, it used to be called the entire and in England, they would sort of pour from the different taps. Oh, yeah, the party, mild, party guile, like yeah. the, multi, the, the mixing of the threads. And exactly. Stuff like that. Yeah, and then yeah. the porters like that. That's kind of what started the porter idea. Yeah, just yeah. that concept of, you know, adding all these little different things together that would create something new kind of yeah. drove me with the, with the malt selection for that, too. So amazing beer, actually. Thank you. And I will name it <laughs> my favorite. Oh, OK. Of the That's show. The every every show I do. I mean, actually, it's funny because I was, I was actually pretty much sure it was going to be the Wilford because the Wilford's kick ass. Thank you. Uh, and I mean, and to be fair to McJaggery and Bitter, it's a really good too. But the Kitchen Sink Porter is, is really... That's the for you. Well, it's just a really interesting beer. Like, a, it's, it's, it's a really remarkable experience to try this and go like, you know, you, you could spend about a week writing your notes down on this beer. You'd be like, another sip, another sip. Yeah, that's a hard sip. one to enter into competitions. It just doesn't really fall in. Well, yeah, that, that's, and that's actually one of the funny, funny, inter funny interesting challenges is that these are all so creative. I think the porter, out of all my beers, I think that's probably the best food pairing beer because of those different elements and flavor. You could, it really you could, does you well. Probably, you could probably almost, like, you could, like, so you did the oysters with this. I, I did, yeah, it was oysters with shaved fennel, chive, and sweet orange, wow. and a little bit of lemon. Wow. Sweet orange, because there is a bit of tartness yeah, in this, it was, right? It was amazing, yeah. It Historically, was, the porters, I mean, they thought, they thought they were a bit sour, too, right? Like, right, well, you know, a lot of the beers were in casks, and, you know, there's a lot of uh, yeah. wild, funky things growing on yeah, in there. Um, yeah. Even, you know, for example, um, I believe I, I do use some acidulated malt in there, um, which does kind of add a little bit of tartness what, to what's it. What's acidulated malt? Um, it's malt that is, well, uh, Acid, acid? It's like? lactic acids on the malt. Oh, really? Interesting. Um, and it gives a little bit of tartness. Guinness does that in there. I ah. believe they do that in their beers. That's why it has just that little tiny hint yeah. of tartness in there. Um, it's in there, too. That's really and that's, fabulous. yeah, and that's kind of what I wanted to come across in that beer as well. I got to say, this has been amazing. Thank I mean, you very we, much. We are in a nano so. brewery <laughs> that makes a ton of beers that are all delicious. This is some really great beer that, I've, like, like I said, at least two of these I've never had anything like it. And this one is like this one's going to disappear off, off camera, but I mean, that would probably will too. But but this is like, yeah, some really great beers. I appreciate that. I want to thank you, like sincerely, sincerely, for being here to let us on the show. Pleasure's and, mine. Thank uh, you. Yeah. So we we tend to say. Cheers. Cheers. Slancha. Slancha. Skol. Skol. Prost. Prost. <laughs> Nazdrovia. No rock. <laughs> Wait. No rock. I've never heard no rock. What is no rock? That is, um, oh gosh, why am I forgetting that now? <laughs> oh, he's on the spot. Uh, that is Romanian. Roma My no rock. Romanian, so, yeah. That's awesome, because I've got, I've got a whole bunch of, this, that's the first no rock I've ever had. Nice. So no rock. So no rock. <laughs>